deep in the heart of the Nevada desert, in a barren, desolate valley, there exists a place that the United States government would rather you not know about. A military base so secret, the Pentagon refuses to admit it exists. A place that has been the launching site for the most advanced aeronautical technology the world has ever known. The base itself has a buffer zone estimated at over 12 miles. There are no gates, but those who stand guard have permission to shoot anyone who attempts to penetrate its border. The people who work here are sworn to secrecy. They fly in every morning on jets with no markings. The windows are painted over. A base so secret, it doesn't even have a name, at least an official one. In the past, aerospace workers referred to it as Groom Lake for the dry lake bed adjacent to its runways. Some know it simply as the ranch. The air traffic control tower at the base uses the code name Dreamland, but most know it by the region's designation on an obscure U.S. geological survey map, which places the world's most secret military base on a grid marked Area 51. It started out as a place to fly experimental airplanes in secret. It was remote, the terrain foreboding, and virtually inaccessible. Which is why back in the 1950s, the United States government developed a keen interest in the Nevada desert. So much of an interest that the Department of Defense took control of a huge chunk of land, larger than Switzerland, for use as a desert laboratory. The Nevada test site, as it is called, was used for the testing of nuclear bombs. Satellite photographs show the pockmarked surface of A-bomb testing sites, such as Mercury, Nevada, home of above-ground nuclear detonations. But A-bomb tests aren't all that is done out here. Part of the test site is used as a bombing range for Nellis Air Force Base near Las Vegas. The air base and target area are all part of the Nellis Range Complex, where virtually every fighter pilot in the free world comes to test their skills in war games above the Amargosa Desert. But besides the nuclear testing and beyond the air base, there was a third element to the Nevada test site, developed in the 1950s to test fly top secret aircraft. A 60 square mile region encompassing two valleys surrounded by the Groom Mountain Range. It was here, the place many now refer to as Area 51, that the government, specifically the CIA, decided to have aerospace giant Lockheed test a secret plane built to spy on the Soviet Union. It was called the U-2. The CIA went out in about 1955 to uh, the northern part of the Nevada test site and establish this area on the Groom Dry Lake for the testing of advanced aircraft technology. Um, the kind of unofficial version, and from what I've been able to research, there is some support of this, is that even in the 1940s, perhaps the late 1940s, the Navy had an auxiliary uh, naval airfield out there and they used to uh, store nuclear weapons out there at the Groom Lake facility. Now there were only a few buildings up at that time. Now one alleged eyewitness said that in 1948 there were five buildings and one of them was a hangar. For years this is where the US government tested its greatest airborne secrets. Many of them planes built by Lockheed's legendary Skunk Works the aerospace company's assembly plant used to piece together top-secret government projects. Besides the U-2, it is where the super-secret SR-71 Blackbird first took to the air. Later came the F-117A stealth fighter. There have been suggestions that Northrop Grumman's B-2 stealth bomber was also flight-tested here, all of which made Area 51 famous to aviation buffs like Chuck in Clark. Aerospace, and I've always had an interest since I was a young kid, and uh, I started hearing about a place called Groom Lake in the early uh, 70s from uh, people that work at Lockheed that occasionally would fly out here and spend a couple of weeks working on a secret aircraft. And although they wouldn't tell me much, they sort of, you know, explained where it was and in the general nature of what was going on out here. And So a few years ago, two and a half years ago, I finally decided it's time to pack up and go over there and check it out for myself. Groom Lake is a part of Area 51. It is a dry lake bed surrounded by the Groom Mountain Range. After hearing about it as an inquisitive teenager, it was only recently that Chuck Clark came to investigate the area on his own. What he found was very much what he expected, based on the rumors from Lockheed engineers he had befriended years ago while growing up in Southern California. 
very large non-existent base according to the military uh, with a six mile runway and a three mile runway which is brand new. Uh, it continues to grow to this day uh, where everything else is being either closed or scaled back. This thing just grows and grows and grows. Uh, for the most part they're testing uh, black project uh, spy planes, you know, next generation spy planes, uh, things that you would expect that they'd be doing in such a location. Among the latest projects under development at the base is the Aurora, a supersonic reconnaissance aircraft that reportedly uses a unique propulsion system using a combination of cryogenic methane or ammonia. The aircraft is believed to have a unique roar, according to residents of the desert area, and leaves contrails that look like donuts strung together on a rope. The Aurora project is the latest in a long line of classified government experiments using the most advanced technology. Experiments that the United States has gone to amazing lengths to keep from foreign governments and from its own people. Glenn Campbell is a computer scientist who has spent years studying Area 51. The name Area 51 refers to a block of land about 60 miles square. The name Dreamland refers to a block of airspace above that land, which is much larger. Dreamland is, is not a, a secret name. It is used by pilots on, on routine military maneuvers out here. And Dreamland is known as the box to pilots. It is a place where you do not fly. There are numerous stories of military pilots on routine exercise here wandering across the boundary of this Dreamland airspace being forced down at the base and being severely debriefed. This is the sort of mistake that would end careers in the military and, and certainly has. If you land at Dreamland, you may never fly again. The boundary of this non-existent military facility is patrolled by non-existent security guards. Uh, these are guards wearing camouflage fatigues without name tags, without insignia, driving unmarked white Jeep Cherokees. Uh, we call them, for want of a better name, the camo dudes for their camouflage fatigues. Uh, they patrol both the military land and the adjoining public lands, and this is what disturbs some people. The workers who are out there now don't talk. They're absolutely terrified of talking. They have absolutely have drilled into these people that this is something you do not talk about. And you really have the fear of God. You see the fear of God in their eyes if I were to confront somebody out here uh, at the uh, McCarran Terminal where people take off. Uh, but the former workers, or workers who are not directly connected to Area 51, let's say the work at the nuclear test site, I find them coming to me to ask me what I think of the Bob Lazar story. He may be the first former worker at Area 51 to speak out publicly about the base and what he did there. In 1989, Robert Lazar was interviewed on a Las Vegas television station. The first interview was done in silhouette to protect Lazar's identity. But after claiming that his life had been threatened, Lazar went public with an amazing story. That besides testing super secret jets, the American government was also in the process of analyzing extraterrestrial spacecraft. The testers company reproduced a flying saucer model based on Lazar's description. Bob Lazar's story is certainly a piece of work. It's a fascinating story, whether you regard it as a hoax or reality. He claims that he went to work for, for a few short months at a government facility where he worked with nine alien spacecraft, dissected them, found out something about how they worked. How this story differs from anybody else's stories is that it's highly specific. It's highly limited. It's a disciplined story. He's not saying he saw any aliens. He's not saying he knows what the alien agenda is. He's just saying, this is where I went, this is where I did, that's all I know. Lazar claims the alien spacecraft was not actually housed at Area 51, but in a valley just south of the base at Papoose Dry Lake. Lazar says this region was called S-4. It's completely surrounded by mountains, and as with Area 51, does not appear on any maps. The only pictures of it have been taken by the former Soviet Union from space. Lazar claims he worked for several weeks at S-4 after being hired by the government as a propulsion engineer. He claims to have obtained the position on the recommendation of Dr. Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. Lazar said he had previously worked for Teller at the Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratory in New Mexico. His new job at the secret desert base, according to Lazar, was reverse engineering the propulsion system of a flying saucer, 
one of nine that Lazar claims were kept inside a hangar built into a hillside. Lazar has given a detailed description of what he saw, explaining that the craft used a combination of matter and antimatter for propulsion. He says only once did he see one of the alien craft actually fly. He says he never saw an alien or was told of how the government had obtained the spacecraft. Bob Lazar is highly specific about what he saw. He can describe it in great detail. His descriptions of this craft that he worked with, this flying saucer, have resulted in this plastic model kit produced by the Tester Corporation. Uh, he will tell you flat out whether something is right or wrong. Uh, most of the time when he's spoken in public, he's just taken questions, and you can throw any question at him in a technical vein, and he will come back with a solid-sounding answer, one that real physicists, physicists can debate back and forth. That's what I admire about that story. Campbell admits Lazar's story cannot be verified, and it is hard to believe. What he finds most interesting, however, are some of the people who do think that Bob Lazar is telling the truth. These workers are as fascinated with the Bob Lazar story and the Area 51 mystique as, as the rest of us, and, and they don't know what's going on out there. They can't say what's in the next hangar or what's over the next hill. These things, these programs are highly compartmentalized. You go there, you do your job, you go to your workplace, and that's all you see and all you know and all you'll ever talk about. So I know former workers who worked there in the 70s, uh, and they're, they're open to the story. They, they think that, uh, yes, there's something like that going on at Papoose Lake. Uh, one worker even said that he knew this area as Area S4, just like Bob Lazar referred to it. As, and it was strictly off-limits to these workers, so they're curious. Lazar says he was disturbed by his discovery and thought the public had a right to know about the research being conducted on alien technology. He claims, though, that by violating his oath of secrecy, the government has erased any and all of the records verifying his background. There is no record of his employment at the Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratory, although a phone book was reportedly discovered which included Lazar's name and an extension number. Lazar claims his educational record has also been purged from the schools he says he attended, MIT and Caltech. Both institutions claim he never was a student there. Whether the edu problem with the educational credentials means that he's lying about the S-4, that's not necessarily true. It just means that you can't take his story uh, in isolation. You have to go and look for other stories. And I still leave the, open, the door open to it. I think it could be true. Time after time, Lazar has turned down opportunities to make a lot of money off of this. It, it, there is a, a movie deal in the works, but time after time, that has been shot down because Bob Lazar insisted that it be the real story, not a Hollywood's fictionalized version. To many, however, Lazar's motivations are as clear as the Nevada night sky. Since his story was first publicized, scores of UFO investigators, believers in extraterrestrials, and even curious tourists have trekked to the area just outside the borders of the secret base. They gather at the black mailbox, which belongs to a local rancher. It's the only landmark for miles. It is at this site that Chuck Clark claims to have periodically witnessed unidentified flying objects. Glowing craft uh, that take off from actually south of the, uh, the base out there itself in the next valley over. Uh, and they seem to be capable of doing, uh, going from a dead stop to several thousand miles an hour, stop on a dime, do a 90 or 120 degree turn without decelerating, th things that just don't fall into our physics. Clark says he first witnessed what he terms UFO technology over the base one evening in February of 1995. This video, shot with a Sony Nightscope telephoto lens in late spring 1995, shows what appears to be a large glowing object just above the groom range. The light appears to change in intensity, and there are no normal aircraft strobes. The light hovers above the groom range for about 30 seconds, then disappears behind the mountain. For a while, what I thought was a illumination flare that had risen from the airspace and uh, uh, hung motionless in the sky, uh, quite brilliant uh, yellow-white light about the size of the planet Jupiter or Venus or something like that. Uh, and then slowly descended, and uh, when it got down to the hill line, instead of disappearing behind the hills, as I expected, it was in front of the hills. Uh, it uh, got down to 20 or 30 feet above the ground where it stopped. And uh, because it was quite bright, it was illuminating the ground. I could see clearly where it was, and I was still of the opinion it was a flare. I just thought it was blowing out from the base and that they were going to start a range fire with it. 
and then suddenly the thing streaked sideways, covered 4.8 miles distance in, oh, one to one and a half seconds. I didn't clock it, it's only an estimate, but on the outside, one and a half seconds, and that's still in excess of 9,000 miles an hour. When it stopped, it didn't slow down and stop, it just stopped cold, and it hovered for a few more seconds, then it vanished in place. This home video was made by a visitor to the black mailbox who tries to keep in focus a bright light darting across a region just south of Area 51, the approximate location of S-4, where Robert Lazar contends that nine alien spacecraft were based. What in the world is it? Here at the black mailbox. We've got people from Japan just up the road here. We're at Groom Lake. Also recording the air channels. I can hear jets in the background. I'm gonna zoom back a little bit. This is looking straight over Steve Medellin's ranch right here off 375 Highway. This is right over the peaks. I'm panning way back for reference, to see no reference. I'm going to zoom back in, moves away, comes forward. I'll turn on headlights now. Turn the headlights back off. Headlights back on. Looking for reference. Got the 35 mile an hour speed limit sign going back up above the mountain. Boy, this is hard to nail. Trying to zoom in, I'm maxed out on zoom. Camera's perfectly still and this thing is all over the place. The object seen in this home video is very similar to what Chuck Clark says he has seen on several occasions at this site. Again, he was too far to notice any detail in the object, but could clearly witness its lightning speed movements. It was about 13 and a half miles distant from my position, and then when it did come down in front of that hill and I could see precisely where it was, it was still 12 miles from me, and so I got the impression that this was about the size of uh, a fuselage of an aircraft. I think it was big enough to be, you know, piloted. Uh, 30, 40 foot across, something like that, but I was too far to, to see any, uh, uh, any structure or any shape, and it's also self-luminous, and, and sometimes also, and that's another thing that shows up, uh, apparently the luminosity is some sort of a byproduct of the propulsion system, because quite often, just before a maneuver is made, the brightness will change. It'll either intensify or dim a little. Uh, it, sort of, it sort of cues you that something's going to happen. This video, taken by a professional photographer, shows a bright light in the distance above the base. The object enters the camera's view in the lower right side of the frame. It's moving so fast that it's difficult to see. The object makes radical movements at extremely high speeds. On several occasions, the object leaves the screen, then reappears, then vanishes. It blinks out, then reappears. Also notice the light's intensity increases just prior to acceleration. We showed this tape to propulsion expert Mary Bowden for her analysis. The things that seem very unusual about this um, that we've just seen are the velocity that it appears to have and <clears throat> the fact that it seems to be doing these um, uh, turns and maneuvers that are not very aerodynamic. And, and a, a vehicle with wings does fairly um, slow controlled turns, I mean relative to what we saw here. If you want to start with the assumptions that um, this vehicle is 13 or more miles away and um, uh, that, it, that it is doing this maneuver um, in essentially the way you see it, which is really a two-dimensional image that we're looking at, um, it is clearly traveling at a very fast rate of speed and it is doing a maneuver um, that is not at all conventional for any sort of spacecraft or, or more likely aircraft that I know of. Um, in, in addition, 
something that's traveling that fast would um, normally is it's uh, traveling, if you calculate the velocity, um, it's faster than the speed of sound, and therefore you would expect to hear some sort of a sonic boom, um, especially if you're only 13 miles away from, um, from this thing. You would you know, very likely hear it. So it's a little confusing how you would get something traveling that fast and doing maneuvers like that without creating a sound, uh, a sonic boom of some sort. Um, uh, none of these things can easily be explained with any sort of uh, technology that I know of right now. On the other hand, I I'm much more willing to believe there are s um, e simpler explanations than to think that it's some sort of a um, alien spacecraft. Although most of the mysterious sightings are from a distance of a dozen miles or more, there are a few who say they have seen objects in the area at a much closer range. Susan Lowe says she was with a friend near the black mailbox one night when she witnessed a bright orb. And um, the first thing we saw was a was a round disc disc shaped craft that was on the horizon. It was actually eye level to us. It was not up in the air. It was an orange shaped color, glowing. It was ground level. It was really odd. There were um, some portholes, what seemed to be kind of portholes around it, and it was a really large craft because it must have been at least a mile and a half away from us mm -hmm. and yet it was maybe it, it probably was I mean I hesitate to say but it was a huge craft from where we were because it was big you know to us and it was probably a mile and a half away at least then there is the experience of Bill Hamilton Hamilton is a UFO investigator he and an associate say they too had a close encounter near mailbox road as we continued to look another light came on to our right and I thought well that's up in the hills somewhere in the Grim Range where this light came on so I told Pamela I said you keep an eye on the original light and I'll keep an eye on this light and I said we've got nothing else to do right so she went on talking and every now and then she'd look through her binoculars and then she tapped me on the shoulder and said you better look at this original light it's beginning to brighten up and as I looked back I noticed that I could see a glow coming from the ground I said, what's going on here? And suddenly, coming up out of this glow, right, rising off the ground and tilting, was an object that appeared to me to be about the size of a bus. And it had lighted windows, or rectangular lights on it. Some of it was amber, some of it was blue-white in color. And at that point in time, I'm saying, oh, my God, and I'm halfway kidding here. I said, what are we looking at here? Is this a UFO? I said, we're scanning the sky, and something's coming up off the ground. At that point, as I'm looking away and I'm looking back at the object through the binoculars, this object is changing its configuration, and it resolves itself into two bright orbs of light. And we're continuing to look at it, and I'm saying, oh, my goodness, what is happening here? Because this thing is changing shape. I've never quite seen that before. And as I continue to look, the lights increase in brilliance. And, it, and the lights became so brilliant, I've never seen anything so bright at night. To believers, Hamilton's story, and that of many others, is proof that the government is testing alien spacecraft at or around Area 51. Now, on any given night, you will find people standing at the black mailbox looking skyward above the Groom Mountain Range. Well, I had a good look in the glasses and uh, it went to the left and it hovered for a while. It was pulsating. And uh, then it uh, started off to the right and just disappeared. You hear a lot of stories about what's going on, what supposedly isn't going on. You know, there's no Area 51, there's no Groom Lake, which is baloney. Uh, but there's also some strange sightings out here. And we're curious. We're very, very curious, and we want to see it. Glenn Campbell is skeptical. He believes that alien craft may once have been housed at Area 51, but has never seen any evidence that they are still there. I first came here about two and a half years ago. I heard the stories 
the UFO literature that you could come to this mysterious desert location and see flying saucers on demand. And this was a little bit go too good to pass up. So I came and I did the traditional thing, which is to sit out in your car and watch the skies for a night or two. And I saw fantastic lights, all of which I came to understand were flares and other lights associated with the bombing runs and the military exercises out here. I succeeded in explaining just about everything that I had heard in the UFO literature in terms of these lights, so I, I began to dismiss most of it. Most people come here wanting there to be alien life, and this is a problem because when you really want something bad, you're going to see the, an ambiguous stimulus and turn it into whatever it is you want. But there are some who never wanted to see a UFO, such as LaRay Fletcher. LaRay had spent over 20 years living outside the base in the remote desert hamlet of Rachel, Nevada. In that time, she had witnessed scores of high-tech jet aircraft crisscrossing the desert sky. She says never once did she pay much attention. But there was one encounter with a flying object that was different than all the others. Rarely does she tell the story for fear of ridicule. I was halfway between uh, the top of Coyote Summit and the bottom of uh, Queen City Summit. Driving your car. Driving my car, Nobody coming home. You know, well, yes, there was another car coming from. I was going west. The other car was going east. What did you see? What did I see? Okay, we were coming. I was coming. There was nothing out there. Absolutely nothing. It was dark, kind of a not a cloudy night, but not really, really clear too. And as I was going, I had gotten past the black mailbox maybe a tenth of a mile or so. And off to my left, there was a huge bank of lights. And when I say huge, I mean huge. It was the biggest thing I have ever seen in my life. I have never been frightened of anything I've ever seen out here before. But this frightened me. I would say it was between maybe four and 500 feet off the ground. And it was doing a jumping jack motion. It was like we're trying to lift up and we can't. It would lift up and then it would drop back down. It would lift up and drop back down. And it did this for oh, maybe four, five, six minutes. And then all of a sudden it just lifted off and was gone. There was nothing there. Just vanished. Just vanished. No vapor trail, no sound, no nothing. Just vanished. It was not saucer shaped. It was more, oh, I don't know what you can call it. Anyway, it, it, I guess if you tilted it, it would look like a saucer. The lights were like a porthole on a ship in the night. Really? They, uh, they were all over the craft, where we, what we could see. And they weren't blinking. They were steady light and they would uh the, below the ship itself as it was going up and down was an orange light like maybe they were trying to see where they were at or it could have been heat i, I, I can't explain it i really can't no one said anything no one did anything but it frightened me tremendously the other fellows that were coming from the other direction, when they got there, they stopped. And uh, one of them is an ex-test site or ex-51 worker. And he made the remark, oh my God, how did this happen? And uh, it was just, it was just very scary. It was like there was something saying, don't you come over here, we won't come over there. But there wasn't anything saying this. It was just a feeling. But we all had the same feeling that there was something, don't go over there. You know, some of my neighbors don't really like us to talk about this, and I have to live here. And other people come in here, and they think you're nuts, and that you make things up. And But once you see it, you don't make it up anymore, if you're making it up. In telling his story, Robert Lazar says he was never told how the American government obtained the flying disks he had been hired to analyze. Some believe the disks are from the legendary incident at Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. It was there that a suspected UFO crashed on a ranch outside a nearby Air Force base. If you believe these Roswell scenarios, these crash scenarios, where would they have bought the hardware? This would be the logical location. This is a remote location, a place where you would bring something potentially dangerous 
that you don't know whether it's going to blow up. You would want this big, vast expanse of land around you, and this certainly provided it. From all different directions, I get sort of anecdotal uh, stories about, for example, uh, the worker I talked to d d never saw any saucers, but his friend Joe saw saucers, and his friend Joe is not inaccessible or dead. I have a lot of stories like that, stories about construction workers who went in to, to construct uh, small quarters with little tiny uh, child's furniture in the quarters. Again, this is all quite unverifiable, but there's a whole folklore, rich folklore, uh, about how the alien presence is out here. And it's a very coherent folklore. The story, same stories come up again and again. Uh, what the stories sort of seem to focus on is a scenario that started with the saucer crashes in the 1940s and 50s. Now, everyone's heard about the Roswell crash uh, in 1947. Uh, one source tells me that there was a, a one in 1953 in Arizona, and that was the beginning of our contact, the U.S. government's contact with alien life. Uh, this sort of scenario says that there were crashes, we recovered craft, we recovered alien bodies, and we even recovered a few live bodies. And those live bodies provided our initial contact. Today you'll meet people who spent the better part of their lives trying to find out what it was. And they say the U.S. government covered it up. What they really believe happened is the crash of a UFO. There's no way you could uh, construe it to be a weather balloon. Well, some friendly person in Washington uh, called us and pointed out that this was restricted information. He said, well, they told me not to say anything. A Closer Look. Hi, I'm Faith Daniels, and welcome to A Closer Look at Strange Lights in the Sky. Experts are saying a lot of people are going to see them this week because of a rare astronomical event. The planets Venus, Jupiter, and Mars are lining up, and some folks are going to swear that they are seeing UFOs. Well, 44 years ago, residents of Roswell, New Mexico, were sure they had seen a flying saucer. They even heard it crash. David Garcia takes a closer look. They say it happened here, almost 44 years ago. Something, some say a flying disc, some say a weather balloon, crashed in this field 75 miles outside of Roswell, New Mexico. Even today, many people around here say it was a UFO, a flying disc, as it was reported in the local paper the next day. They also believe there has been and continues to be a government cover-up of what happened. In 1947, Elizabeth Talk's father was the local sheriff, and she says after he got to the crash site, the government got to him. They told us, my husband, Mr. Wilcox, as she would say, don't you say a word. So he, he didn't, and he was very calm about it. I mean, he just didn't say anything. In fact, the Air Base commander issued a press release describing the crash of some sort of flying disc. That made headlines. Then hours later, the Air Force announced there had been no UFO, simply the crash of a weather balloon. And when the general came in, he told me not to say anything, that he would handle it. Army Intelligence Officer Jess Marcel, Sr., had been one of the first government officials to examine the debris that was found at the scene. Interviewed shortly before his death in 1986, he continued to insist it came from a UFO. I said, well, it looks like balsa wood. It would seem, it would seem lighter than balsa wood. So I got my cigarette lighter, and I said, I want to see if this stuff would burn. It didn't. A UFO, a government cover-up, not an easy story for most people to accept around Roswell, the home in 1947 of the world's only atomic attack bomber group. The people didn't question their government, and for nearly 50 years, they have lived with it. For A Closer Look, I'm David Garcia in Los Angeles. After all the years of controversy, a new book about the incident is coming out. It is called UFO Crash at Roswell. It's based on interviews with more than 300 people. And the author, retired Air Force Captain Kevin Randall, is with us now. After 44 years, why should we care whether this happened or didn't happen? It's probably the biggest story of the century, maybe of the millennium. We're talking about the contact of, uh, with 
life from other planets. We finally learn that we're not alone in the universe. This is a story that proves it to us. But there have been so many alleged sightings. Why should we believe that what happened in Roswell was really a UFO? Because this is the one sighting we have where we've got all the elements we need. We've got over 300 witnesses, people who were there who saw it. We know that there was wreckage recovered. The government has the wreckage. We know that bodies were recovered. The government has the bodies. This will, is the one case that can prove the whole phenomenon, give it the reality that it needs. The government has wreckage and alien bodies? Alien bodies, yes. You say that so seriously? And it's because it's absolutely true. We have uh, probably... If it's so true, why haven't we heard about it? You have heard about it. You just have ignored it. This stuff stuff has leaked into the press a number of times, and the story is so incredible, it's what we call a self-keeping secret. People don't want to believe it. They read the story, and they ignore it. We can go back through the newspapers and the news magazines from 1947 on. We can find the story appearing periodically. Sometimes it's around Aztec, New Mexico. Sometimes it's involved other things. But we can find it appearing, and people just ignore that. So we have heard about it. If it's the biggest story of the century, why would the government cover it up? In 1947, we just come out of one of the most disastrous wars that had ever been fought. In 1947, they didn't know what they were dealing with. They were presented with a technology that was so far superior to ours that they needed to keep it covered up. In 1961, the Brookings Institute did a report for the United States uh, Senate, uh, for, the, for NASA. And in that, they talked about what would happen if there was a confrontation between people of Earth and an extraterrestrial society. And the conclusions were based on our own history that when a superior civilization confronts an inferior civilization, the inferior civilization ceases to exist. Well, allow me to raise an eyebrow for the next 30 minutes, if you will. <laughs> we're gonna, we'll come back and talk to you a little bit later. Right now we're going to head out to Roswell and find out what the people there are saying. And we have some people who say they absolutely believe it. <laughs> are still talking about what happened back in 1947. In places like the cafe at Roswell Inn, folks will gladly sit down a cup of coffee and try to convince you that it really happened. At the cafe this morning, we have three people who remember what happened, Walter Hott, Art McQuitty, and Glenn Dennis. Hi, guys. Hey, hi, hi how, is it? how are you? Walter, tell me how you fit into this puzzle. What were you doing back in 47? Well, Faye, back in uh, 1947, I was a public relations officer for at that time, Roswell Army Airfield. I was the one that prepared the news release and sent it, or took it into the newspapers and the radio stations. And that was the extent of my activity uh, insofar as the flying saucer crash uh, is concerned. Who gave you the order to, to issue this press release? It came from Colonel Blanchard, who was the base commander. Uh, he called me on the phone and told me particulars of the uh, information that he had and asked me to get the release out and take it into the news media, did, did, which did, I did. Did he seem like a guy who had just seen a UFO? I honestly can't remember what he sounded like. Uh, that's been 44 years ago. Uh, I don't think he was that emotional individual that you could tell by his voice uh, whether he was excited or it was just a normal situation for him. After you typed up this press release saying there was a UFO, though, I can't imagine it could be a normal situation for anybody, out comes this weather balloon press release that contradicts everything. Well, I think that was part of the cover-up, and it's quite possible that this went a little bit further in that the press release may have been the start of a cover-up that evolved around stating that we had it and then while well, people were talking about it in the community and then coming back and saying well it was a weather balloon which pretty well squelched all the uh, rumors about it being a flying saucer art you were the editor at the paper when walter walked in and handed you a press release saying that the military thinks that a ufo has just crashed what did you do when you saw that release i about jumped out of my skin i was i i firmly believed that all of the people who were reporting saucers were really seeing them. And so when uh, they brought the press release in saying that they had discovered the wreckage of a UFO, although they didn't call them that in those days, they were called saucers, uh, I got very excited. And uh, I turned to the AP ticker in our office, and lo and behold, the story was already on the ticker. And I said, Walter, what the heck are you doing? You scooped us. It turns out that. Uh, they took turns giving the press releases, and the, one of the radio stations had already moved it. Then they come back at you and say it was a weather balloon. Did you buy the weather yeah, well, balloon theory? 
No, I did not buy it because I firmly believed that what people were seeing were from an, another celestial organization, and, and, and uh, I, I was very comfortable that they had found the wreckage of a saucer. All right, on to Glenn Dennis. Glenn, you were the base funeral director at the time. How did you get involved in this? <laughs> well, I wasn't the base funeral director. I was a funeral director at the Ballard Funeral Home in Roswell at the time, <coughs> and uh, I, got, I received a telephone call from the uh, mortuary officer at the air base uh, inquiring about certain types of casket sizes like three foot six inches or a foot foot casket and uh, what was available and how many what did we have in stock and I informed them we only had like a four foot but we could get whatever they needed within 24 hours you must have thought that was a little odd to have that kind of a request and then you came upon a nurse who said that she saw alien bodies well <clears throat> the nurse uh, she was a nurse there at the base that I knew quite well. Uh, she would walked in on this unintentionally. She went into one of the examining rooms to uh, pick up some supplies. And uh, <clears throat> she, uh, the doctors, there were two doctors, two pathologists that were doing a, a partial autopsy on, it looked she like she in. says. We have a drawing that you apparently drew based on her description of it. Well, she gave me a description. She drew that uh, description for me uh, on the back of a, a prescription uh, pad that she always carried in her purse, I mean, in her uniform. Do you, do you ever find out what happened to that nurse? No, we never have. I haven't heard from her since. All right, guys, thanks a lot for sharing your part of the story. We're going to continue to unravel the mystery in just a moment. We'll meet someone who says he actually handled parts of the wreckage. Want to close what comes back? <laughs> We're back now on a closer look. Our next guest was 11 years old back in 1947. Jesse Marcel Jr. is the son of Air Force Major sent to inspect the wreckage. And he was there when his dad brought some of that wreckage home. You actually saw this stuff? Well, I handled it uh, as it was brought in from the car and placed on our kitchen floor in the house in Roswell. What did it look like? Well, it was a lot of uh, foil-like uh, fragments with uh, old Bakelite type pieces of plastic and then structural members like uh, I-beam type material. Had you ever seen anything like that before? Not really. Never? Not to, not to my knowledge, no. Could it have been a weather balloon? I had seen weather balloons because I was given one one time by my dad, but it was not that, I assure you that. Now, I read a newspaper account from the time, and the rancher who collected this debris described it as foil and sticks and paper and tape. Does that look like what you saw? Uh, I didn't see any paper or sticks, but I saw it was all metal and some pieces of plastic. The newspaper account at the time said that the, the, the debris gathered up completely weighed about five pounds. Could a, could a UFO weigh five pounds? Well, not a real UFO, I wouldn't think. So what do you think this was that you were handling? It was a very remarkable piece of material. I'm, you know, it had uh, writing on it that was very uh, strange. That was the part that really set it off from anything that I had ever seen, was the uh, type of writing that was uh, embossed or imprinted on the inner surface of these uh, I beams that were in there. Would you liken it to hieroglyphics? Or? Um, I thought of it as resembling hieroglyphics at the time, but uh, no, not really, but just resembling hieroglyphics. It was kind of a purple violet hue embossed on the inside. Of Have it. you ever seen anything like this since then? No, sure not. Is it possible that it was like an enemy spy satellite or something? Unless they're using strange material, strange writing. Hmm. What happened to it after it left your kitchen? Well, I helped my uh, dad load it back onto the car, and he took off for the air base, and that was the last I saw it. Yeah, and what about your dad? What did he do with it then? I understand he flew it to Carswell Air Base the, that night or the next day. I'm not sure. Would they have given so much attention to a weather balloon? It doesn't seem likely. No, not to fly a, a weather balloon to Carswell in a B-29, which is rough, not very cost-effective. Why didn't you try to keep any of it? I didn't. I was Air Force. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <You> <laughs> not my material. Play by the rules. You bet. Huh? That's right. Your daddy firmly believes that what he saw was a UFO? We discussed it later, and uh, that was the only thing we could come up with. That was the only thing that he could conclude. That was it. Do you also believe that there was a government cover-up? I think there was, because he was part of it. He was part of it? In yeah. what way? Well, he had to then uh, backtrack on the flying saucer uh, story and uh, put out the story that this was a weather balloon. But I assure you it was not a weather balloon. And he didn't buy the weather balloon? No, ma'am. 
Sure. Uh, but he was Air Force. He went along with it. That's All right. right. Major exactly. Mitchell, thanks a lot for talking with us. Mm, Closer look. We'll come back after this. We're back on A Closer Look. We're joined again by retired Air Force Captain Kevin Randall, who authored the book on, uh, entitled UFO Crash at Roswell. Also joining us is Stanton Friedman, a nuclear physicist. He has interviewed many of the witnesses and is still pursuing the release of the official government documents in the case. Welcome. Why are you still so interested after all this time? The biggest story of the millennium, as Kevin said earlier. I started research on this in the mid-70s. The more I dug into it, the more believable it was, the more evidence we found. Uh, I've been interested in flying saucers for over 30 years, and this is the key case. And I think it's one that everybody in the world ought to be interested in, but trying to get people to speak out is difficult. Do you think there was a government cover-up? Uh, there's no question about that, not only about this case, but lots of other UFO cases. What does the government have to gain if it's the biggest story of the millennium? Well, <laughs> several different things it has to gain. First of all, it means it has access to technology that might enable it to build better weapons delivery and defense systems, since they can fly circles around anything we got for it. You got wreckage. Good place to start. Second, you worry about what if the other guy figures out how they work before you do? How do you defend against them? You don't want them to know you know they know. And the third is the big political question. If you make an announcement that indeed there are alien spacecraft, there's going to be a push by the younger generation for an earthling orientation. Obviously to aliens, we're all earthlings. No government on this planet that wants its citizens to owe their allegiance to the planet instead you of an individual like government. You look like such a smart, intelligent guy, and we're talking about earthlings and aliens. I mean, That's because I've been studying the evidence for 30 years. Yeah. It's time the media got involved in studying well, the evidence. Well, we're, we're here. We're, we're involved. Working on it. Yes. Well, tell me why the aliens chose Roswell. I, I don't speak for aliens, but New Mexico was unique in the world at that time as the only place where you could look at the three aspects that showed that earthlings would be going to the stars, three new technologies. And if you were an alien at that time, you'd worry about earthlings coming out, a primitive society. One was atom bombs. First test was not far from where this happened. Second was rockets. We were firing German V2s not far from when, where this happened. Third was radar. Our best radar was used to track the uh, rockets. There was only one place in the world. Remember that the group involved in this, Major Marcel, this was the only atomic bombing group in the entire world, and he was the intelligence so officer for that guy. group. Well, and high-level clearances, aware of everything else that was going on, so worried about counterintelligence. So it could have been a spy satellite or something. There something. were no satellites. First satellite didn't go up for 10 years after that. So there goes that right out the window. Yeah, uh, 10 years a long time. You know, we have a, a statement from the Air Force. It says there's been no evidence indicating sightings categorized as unidentified are extraterrestrial vehicles. No, the, stating, uh, the statement goes much beyond that, and they say in the possession of the Air Force if you read the original statements. And well, in the, the first Force, place, the way national it? security works, there's no reason to believe what the Air Force says about anything. I mean, the black budget of the United States, not under congressional control, is now running at $34 billion a year. The National Security Agency alone spends over $10 billion a year, half the people in my lecture audiences. As a scientist, I've spoken to over 600 colleges, so I get a good feedback. Half the people have never heard of the NSA, so if you can hide $34 billion a year, hiding a few saucers, lying a few times, I mean, here, here's what you get We're, under Freedom of Information from the National it. Security Agency. Here's a released UFO document. This deals with UFO. From this the is CIA. what they're handing you. Yeah, this is what you get. It took me five years to get this released CIA UFO document. You can read eight words Our government on it. at work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the magic key that opens all the doors, you know. Here's a 33-year-old document. I just got it two months ago. That's what you can read about it. So people have the wrong idea that uh, there can't be a cover-up. It's very easy to have a cover-up, and the crash at Roswell is a, an important component of that. Kevin, you interviewed 300 people, so many of them eyewitnesses. Did you ever actually interview somebody who said that they saw with their own eyes alien bodies? Yes, we've probably interviewed, interviewed half a dozen people that saw the alien bodies with their own eyes. There's no question about it. They were on the impact site. We were told security at the impact site was extremely tight. There were armed guards around. The, uh, the, the craft itself, armed guards around the area, and armed guards thrown in a cordon around there so you couldn't even use the roads to get into the area. i tell you what, you I've guys, you guys have a convincing so argument going. All right, a closer look. We'll come back after this. We're back now on a closer look with the mayor of Roswell, William Brainerd. Mayor, how did you first hear about uh, these UFOs? Well, good morning, Faith. Uh, my first... Uh, knowledge of it came in 1965, some 12 years after I got here. Uh, we issued invitations to all the past commanders of the base to come for a weekend, and 23 generals showed up. Uh, one of them was uh, Butch Blanchard, who was then a four-star general. 
And uh, most of the people there in Roswell now believe that this happened? At this time? Yeah. I, I don't know. There's a certain amount of skepticism around, but uh, I think at this point, uh, given the continuing uh, and increasing evidence, uh, it's becoming harder and harder to refute it. Well, you're having a UFO day there, so somebody's got to buy it. When is right, UFO we day? Are. Uh, that'll be on July the 10th when uh, Mr. Randall and Mr. Schmidt will be here, the authors of the book. Uh, they'll hold a symposium, uh, go over some of the evidence, and uh, uh, kind of bring the public up to speed with what their uh, book uh, details. All right, Mr. Mayor, thanks a lot for talking with us today. I still have the two people with me here in New York, and I want to continue our conversation for the few seconds that we have left to find out if anybody ever threatened people you tried to get at. Yes. <laughs> yes. We both have talked to people who've said that they were threatened. In some cases, their families were threatened. The uh, government strength at that time, just after the war, was very powerful. When they told you not to say anything, most people didn't say anything. And we've talked to people now who says, I signed a security oath. I can't talk about it. 44 years but ago. But to take it one step further, we've talked to people today who have told us that lately, within the last year, yeah. they have been threatened. So the government cover-up continues today. They don't want the people talking about it. The government tracks these people for 44 years? Absolutely. They know Easy where they are. <laughs> they, know where, they know where everybody Glenn is. Glenn Dennis said that a nurse saw the autopsies being done. Did you ever find her? No. We've, we've tried very hard to find her. Gone. She was shipped out, and then supposedly there was a plane crash. But we can't verify the plane crash. We no. think we know what, what happened to her, but we haven't been able to locate her. <sighs> We're right. working Interesting. on it. Closer look comes back. Tough. And now that school's out for most kids, we've decided to look at topics of special interest to kids. On Monday, a closer look at Ninja Turtles and what they do to your kids. We'll see you next time. Uh, this sort of scenario says that there were crashes, we recovered craft, we recovered alien bodies, and we even recovered a few live bodies. And those live bodies provided our initial contact. Since then, since 1953, uh, the alien information was all taken out of the government agencies that had it. The CIA doesn't have it. The NSA doesn't have it. All this information was brought into another government agency, which to this day does not exist. That agency, um, one source calls it the satellite government, the separate agency, uh, has been reproducing these craft and has been successful in doing it. We started with their technology in 1953. We, we are unable to, to fly their craft, so they teach us how to reproduce these craft. And now we have them, and who knows what we're doing with them. Uh, I can't tell you this scenario is true or false, but it, it comes up again and again from a lot of unverified sources. I know of two sources, both who are telling this story both of whom can't be entirely verified. One is Bob Lazar, of course, telling his tale, and the other one is, is uh, an old fellow, 70 years, 70 years old, who, who claims that he's uh, worked with simulators, that he helped design simulators to train pilots to fly our versions of these alien flying saucers. Now, this makes a certain cracked amount of sense. If the government is reproducing saucers, then it has to have this support structure, including the building of flight simulators and, and all the other things that go into the, an aircraft development program. His story, like Lazar's, is highly specific. He can, he can talk in great technical detail about how the craft works, about the systems that he designed, and then as you're getting to other areas like the aliens and what their agenda may be, he lo knows a lot less information because obviously these programs are highly compartmentalized. You don't know the whole picture. He was directly briefed about how the alien program started, and he was directly told that these were alien craft that he was uh, reproducing. Uh, the briefings consisted of uh, a description of how the program started, and the program started in 1953 with a crash in, near, near Kingman, Arizona. There were four live aliens in that crash. In fact, it didn't really seem like a crash at all because the ship was in perfect condition and the aliens were in perfect condition. My source believes it was a setup. What uh, this began was a form of cooperation between a secret government agency and the aliens. The aliens gave us technology. 
They taught us how to build these craft, and obviously the aliens are getting something else in return. It's not entirely clear what that is, but there are some elements involved, and my source says boron and arsenic are the two elements. Um, so this is a nice coherent story, and I, I, I receive it as oral folklore, as oral history, like someone telling me about how the Hoover Dam was built or some old event that I, I can't participate in indirectly. It that, has that sort of legitimacy and that sort of feel to it. But of course, this is a non-existent program. It's highly secret, and I can't verify any of this stuff. Neither can anyone else. But that hasn't stopped scores from trying. And while most UFO investigators use their eyes to help unlock the mysteries of Area 51, there are a few who use their ears. Ralph McCarran and his friends are experts at cracking secret radio frequencies. They call themselves the Freak Masters. In the daytime, they monitor cockpit transmissions from aircraft flying near and around Nellis Air Force Base, which occasionally stages air combat games known as Red Flag. But it's at night that the group turns its antenna towards Area 51 in the attempt to decode radio traffic at the super-secret base. They listen for transmissions between the air tower and flights into the base, as well as the radio traffic from the security detail, which combs the surrounding hills looking for trespassers. Some of their methods they use are ground sensors. When your vehicle passes by on the road, it's sensed and a radio signal is sent to their control room, alerting them that you're already in the area. Again, that's on public land. And actually, it's not supposed to be legal, but they use it to their advantage. It gives them early warning when we're in the area. Uh, if you're listening, they're security freaks. They immediately come alive. Fortunately, it's scrambled, so we can't tell what they're saying. But at that time, you'll notice security vehicles entering the area you're going into. They don't seem to want to make contact with you, but they let you know that you're in there, and they keep an eye on you the entire time. You can see anything from conventional aircraft to uh, lights that seem to shoot across the sky at incredible speeds, uh, lights doing incredible maneuvers in the sky, which I find totally unexplainable. It doesn't seem like we have that capability that I'm aware of. And like to be uh, able to find out just what these vehicles are. No doubt about it, there's something out there. What is going on? The answer depends on who you talk to. Obviously, the government is hiding something. But what? And if it is flying saucers from an alien planet, why would they be so careless as to conduct nightly displays over the desert floor? Chuck Clark believes that the government, despite all its secrecy, may have welcomed the emergence of Area 51 as the international home for UFO viewing. He believes there is a chance Uncle Sam is attempting to introduce the public to the existence of extraterrestrial life. He says it may be part of a program undertaken years ago at the advent of the space age. Yeah, well, that was one of the things that our government looked at back in the uh, late 50s, very early 60s, when we were about to send man up in, into space. Uh, uh, NASA went to the Brookings Institute, and I believe they also threw this at the RAND Corporation in Santa Monica, which were both think tanks, and uh, said, okay, now we're about to go into space. What happens if we get up there and we meet somebody? How do we tell the people of the world? And it wasn't how do we keep it from them, it's how do we tell them. And basically, they came back with their study, and they said, um, we have a 30-year plan where you start with wild, unsubstantiated rumor mixed with this information, and, and over the period, you get more and more accurate, and you, you condition them to soften the blow. And I, I think that's what's been going on. If that is true, that the government is conditioning the public into accepting that we have been visited by aliens from another planet, they sure picked a lonely spot for such a cosmic introduction. Scalded by the desert sun each summer, withered by the freezing winds in winter, nothing comes easy in this part of the world. Not for the ranchers, whose cattle graze on sparse vegetation and who must often drill deep for groundwater to keep their animals from dying of thirst. Not for the miners. The tungsten and silver mines died out long ago. The ore is still in the ground, but it is cheaper to import it from other countries than to dig it out. Remnants of a once thriving industry can be found throughout the desert. 
A fine, lung-clogging dust in the shaft of this mine was believed to have led many miners to an early death. The mine itself was known as the Widowmaker. The community of Delamar, which served the mine, is now a ghost town. The businesses and families having moved away long ago. Among the few tiny hamlets which continue to survive is this loose collection of double-wide trailers, a town named for an infant. Uh, the first baby that was born here in the valley and was delivered by her father, so they de wanted a name for the town. It had been called Sand Springs or just Tempai Ute, a mountain, and they decided that they would like to have a name for it. And when uh, the Joneses named li the little girl, named her Rachel, I, they thought that would be nice to honor little Rachel by naming the town after her. As it turned out, the honor took on a new and tragic significance. Rachel Jones and her family moved to Moses Lake, Washington, after the tungsten mine where her father had been working closed. Three years after her birth, Rachel Jones died. The result of a respiratory condition doctors believed was aggravated by volcanic ash spewed from the eruption of Mount St. Helens. The girl's namesake hasn't changed much over time. The Department of Energy still has a monitoring station here to test the atmosphere for radioactive fallout from the nuclear tests conducted upwind at the Mammoth, Nevada test site. Some of those who live here are seasonal ranch hands who work on nearby cattle ranches. A few are retired, living off pensions and social security, and there is a quiet, low-key group of Area 51 employees. There is a post office, a one-room grocery store, and a restaurant run by Pat and Joe Travis. It was called the Rachel Bar and Grill when they first purchased it. Business consisted of dinners and drinks for a few local patrons each night. Tourists were few and far between, although they occasionally did get a motorist taking the dusty trail known as Highway 375, the YZ Trail, connecting Yosemite to Zion National Park in Utah. But then came Bob Lazar's tale of extraterrestrial spacecraft, and all of a sudden, the curious started showing up searching for flying saucers. So wife and I, we just, uh, you know, I said we'd need to change the name of this place, you know, and because we, we had added the rooms, there was never any rooms here before. So uh, we needed one name. We had the little three motel and Joe and Pat's Rachel Bar and Girl, you know, so we needed to consolidate it under one name, so we just kind of kicked names around and we came up with a little alien. The accommodations aren't what you might call out of this world. Joe and Pat rent out trailers in the back for those spending the night. There's no wine list on the dinner menu. But the little alien has become the unofficial meeting spot for those who come here, seeking to find answers in the Nevada night sky. More than anything, this is a place where everybody can come and talk about anything they want to. If they've been abducted, we can discuss that. If they want to talk about the government, they can do that. If they want to talk about sightings, they can do that. Well, Any experience under the sun that somebody has had is welcome to be talked about here. We don't hide it. A lot of people come in and they're, they're really off in the corner. They don't want to say why they even came up here. But I say, look, we can talk about this. It's not taboo up here. UFO photographs adorn the wall, including a poster of the base just over the mountains. There's merchandise from T-shirts to postcards. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner are served daily. And regardless of what time it is, there will usually be someone with a sympathetic ear for your story. Well, there's one lady that uh, sticks in my mind, you know, she was a young, young lady, about 30, 35 maybe, and she had felt that she had been abducted, and she was afraid to talk to anyone about it, you know. She felt that she maybe had a transplant or something, implant. you know, an implant in her body or something, you know. And she was really uptight, and uh, we, we talk with people, and, and people can vent their spleen because nobody's going to laugh or ridicule them here, you know. I mean, Every, every uh, person has a right to their, uh, to their story, and, and we won't laugh. Nobody, nobody will laugh at them here. I think 90%, maybe 95% of the people... Even 98%. ...are really genuinely honest about what they tell us, they, whether they've been abducted. I don't think we get very many, if you want to call them, kooks. Crackles. Occasionally there, there is one, but uh, that's, that's, not the, that's the exception, that's not the rule. There are a lot of disbelievers. There have been disbelievers even in reporters, but then they've also had those that came as a disbeliever and left here feeling that they had been given 
a lot more than they ever came out knowledge to that that maybe perhaps wouldn't be a, available elsewhere yeah. well, you know, I feel a lot of people that are skeptical or they uh, total they totally disbelieve they come out to see what they can see you know maybe perhaps learn a little bit in the meantime it's something different to do no, we just, also uh, get a lot of travelers from other countries that come here and a lot of them of course aren't even aware that our theme our our talk thing is the aliens or ufos or encounters but we have learned so much about other countries yes. and the same sort of thing that's actually happened in their countries because after a few minutes even a lot of those people from other countries will talk to us about things that have happened and to them. And relate a story that happened in their country, you know, like France or uh, Germany or Switzerland, or wherever Everywhere. it might be. And we have actually had phone calls from Belgium, from England, from Holland, asking us if the stories that they have seen in their country about us are facts. From Paris? I call one more from Paris. <laughs> <laughs> and the things that are on our walls from Japan. They're authentic. The man that did them has been here a couple of times. Sometimes the calls are from news reporters. Some are people planning a one-day diversion during their trip to Las Vegas, and others simply want to hear stories about strange encounters with aliens. And if nobody is in the bar to accommodate, Joe and Pat Travis have some stories of their own to relate. It happened twice. She's, she's the one that, uh, she says, they're here, right here in the room with us. I said, well, talk to them. I can't see them. You know, she was the one that could see them. I, I couldn't. You know. Beam of light came in through the back door. The first winter we were here. It illuminated the entire door jam. We were the only two people here. It was 20 below zero outside. So we realized the doors were not standing open. It was actually physically closed completely. And through the door. And that's why on our postcard, Joe and I are standing in front of that door because that is the same door that this light came through. It left no burn marks, no marks of any kind on the door. Oh. <laughs> it's, it, it, that's the truth, because we were... Were you, were you, were you scared at all? No. no. No, it was a very pleasant uh, feeling. Well, we felt the presence, uh, the energy, if you will. I don't know what, you, you know, you felt someone looking at you. You know, you, you look around and someone's looking at you. Well, this, well. Is, this is a presence that we felt. He told it out loud to make yeah. itself at home said, that it would always be welcome to be here. And I have felt uh, from the beginning that, that some force brought some, call it fate, destiny, whatever, you know, some force brought us to this place. Uh, would guided us or uh, whatever brought us here anyway. And then this is a feeling that we both share, you know, because when I, I lived in Detroit, just outside Detroit, for 30 years, and I hate wintertime and cold. And I told the wife, I, there's two things I don't do. I don't cut grass and I don't shovel snow when we got married. But yet, we are here, you know, and... Uh, he still doesn't cut grass. I still, <laughs> but with the tractor, he will <laughs> shovel <laughs> snow. You get a mite of snow. <laughs> but I have a tractor to shovel snow. <laughs> but if the little alien is Rachel's meeting spot, this is the town's library. The Area 51 Research Center is run by UFO investigator Glenn Campbell as an information clearinghouse for everything from government land grabs around the base to the latest Hollywood studio interested in making a movie about Area 51. Every book that has ever mentioned the base is sold here, along with a model of the flying disc described by Robert Lazar. There's even a book on how to teach your children to live with extraterrestrials. There are hats, patches, and t-shirts, maps and photographs of the base itself. As with the little alien, the Area 51 Research Center gets requests for information from around the globe. From here, the traveler can get directions to the base, along with warnings as to what will happen if you aren't careful. Area 51 may not appear to be a highly secure military base. There are no fences surrounding its 12-mile wide perimeter. But deadly force is authorized for the security detail which comb the mountains. Photographs are not allowed. And if you take one step over the base boundary, you will immediately be detained, cited, and arrested. There was a time when a visitor could get a glimpse of Area 51 without risking arrest. Freedom Ridge, as it was called, gave visitors a distant but unobstructed view of Area 51. Such a good view that recently the Air Force asked and received permission to take the property out of public control. It is now military property and off limits to the public. 
But if you were able to see the base, there's a good chance you wouldn't see much. It's best not seen, because if you see it, if you climb one of these mountains to look down on the secret base, what you see looks like any other ordinary Air Force base. Uh, there's, uh, most of the traffic in and out is routine. Uh, commercial type airliners bringing workers in or, or military type planes. If you saw a secret plane, you might not even recognize it. So a lot of people are disappointed when they come up here. They come from vast distances, as far away as, as Europe and Asia, some of them, to see Area 51. And then when you see it, well, it's not much different than it is in the pictures. Besides, according to Bob Lazar's story, the base with the alien flying saucers isn't Area 51, but Papu Stry Lake in a valley to the south, which is completely surrounded by mountains. Now, Bob Lazar never said he worked with alien craft at Area 51. He said at Papoose Lake, south of Area 51. Unfortunately, you can't see this area. You can't visit this area. Uh, there's no way to investigate this. While you do have this secret base that is nearer to the public and easier to look at, so everyone has focused on Area 51. So many have focused on the base over the past several years that the state of Nevada has seized upon the interest in UFOs to promote the region as a tourist destination. The state recently proclaimed Route 375, which runs through Rachel, Nevada, as the extraterrestrial highway, a road which many have already taken in the search for alien spacecraft. Although some come not because they believe in flying saucers, but because they are fascinated by those who do. Uh, it's a fascinating story, even if there really aren't any um, flying saucers, uh, alien spacecraft, um, just the study of human nature, how people can come to perceive certain things, um, how some people may have an interest in promoting that. Um, I am interested in how it's possible for a perfectly reasonable person, not a kook, you know, not someone that's just subject to wishful thinking, can see something in the sky that really looks inexplicable. But yet, if you work on it a little bit, you can, you can come up with possible explanations of what it is. Uh, I've, I've uh, had more fun <laughs> here in the last couple days talking to everybody than, than I've had in a long time. Everybody loves a secret base. Just tell the public, here, this place doesn't exist, you can't look there. And then, of course, the public wants to know. People love a mystery, and this, this place embodies a mystery. Uh, they could, the military planners could handle things so much better if they gave the base a name and perhaps invited a few journalists to the cafeteria, then the place would lose its mystique. As, as it is now, the government doesn't acknowledge the base at all, aside from a few sentences in a press release. So naturally, it attracts attention. People want to know, and people also impress upon this place anything they want it to be it becomes the center of the new world order or the center of whatever conspiracy you're knitting for yourself. And this is a fascinating process, quite apart from what might be in the base of itself. If you were, to, if, if a public relations manager were to de design a base that's intended to attract attention, they would design a base like this one, one that the government simply doesn't talk about. I approach it as an interesting story, a story that I, I want to collect, but my life goes on as usual without knowing the truth one way or the other. But some do want to know, and don't mind traveling great lengths to find out. They are the people who gather on a warm summer's night at the black mailbox off Highway 375, no doubt hoping that someday there will be a public explanation for those strange lights that dart about the Nevada night sky, above a region that has now become famous around the world as the home of unidentified flying objects, a geological map designation Area 51.
objeto voador brilha muito e desaparece. E cada vez que volta, parece que se multiplica. A luz ficou no céu de Casimiro de Abreu por pelo menos uma hora e meia. O objeto voador foi visto por dezenas de motoristas que passavam pela BR-101. Ele brilha. Muita gente vê. E ninguém consegue identificar o que é. Um disco voador, né? Que doideira, hein? O objeto desaparece e aparece de novo. Ele não tem uma forma fixa. 